Good morning. It's Saturday, uh, another day that we've been given to open up God's Word together. And uh, we're in 1 John, not the Gospel of John, but the Epistle. So if you get, go to the book of the Revelation, go to 1 John chapter 4. We call this series the Me to We series because me, dealing with my assurance of salvation, is going to free me up so that I can then focus on other people. As I grow in my walk with the Lord, my desire to help other people know him is going to grow and grow. So me to we, that's where we get that connection here. We've already gone through the first three chapters. We've already looked at what it is to practice righteousness. Practice righteousness is to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, strength, and mind. If you worked back with that process, I renew my mind with the word and the power of the Holy Spirit. I draw my strength based on what the Bible says rather than my own understanding. I make choices. My soul is my will. The choice that I make based on what I'm learning about God and His Word, not about what I think. And then as I do this over time, uh, my priorities, my heart changes uh, to match that of my Savior Jesus Christ. And so He gives us viable ways to examine whether I really have a biblical relationship with God or whether this is some game that I'm playing in my head. Now, in chapter 3, verse 10, it separates. The first part is about the first part of the great commandment. The second is about the result, loving my neighbor. In 1 John chapter 3, verse 10, it says, By this the children of God... And the children of the devil are obvious. Anyone who practices righteousness, that's what we just talked about, is, is of God. And the one who loves his breath, the brethren, loves their neighbor. So in this, we see this great commandment being played out. Now, as we've talked about this love being played out in our lives, Jesus has given the negative example, don't be like Cain, who murdered his brother. Be like Christ who laid down his own life for others. And that brings us to chapter 4. If you haven't read chapter 4 yet, stop right now. Go read chapter 4. Um, read every word of it. Maybe read it twice. Find words that you think are important. Um, this chapter 4 is going to be very helpful in our understanding of what it looks like to have a relationship with God. So I pray that you are not just being lazy and taking just what I say. Um, remember, Satan's always the one trying to give us shortcuts. There is no shortcut to getting to know God. It's work, 2 Timothy 2.15. You need to be a workman, learning how to rightly handle what God has revealed about himself. Because as, as you and I rightly handle what he's shared about ourselves, uh, about himself, then we'll really start to understand ourselves. So that being said, go back and read. Uh, spend some time. Uh, the more time you spend, the Holy Spirit should help you want more. Um, if, if you want less, well, it probably shows that maybe you've never surrendered your life to the Lord Jesus Christ, but you can today. So uh, before we, we begin, let's bow in prayer. Father God, we love you. We thank you for your word. It is truth. And your spirit, the spirit of truth, come together with your inspired truth and may it produce in us a love for you and a love for each other. Father, may it produce in us conviction over our sin. And when you show us conviction over our sin, may we respond quickly in confessing that you're right and we're wrong. And from that, Father, may we turn from that sin and may we walk in a right relationship with you. Father, give us courage in this process. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. As we come to chapter 4, there's a heading on chapter 4. And I'm reading from a New American Standard version of the Bible. And the reason that I use a New American Standard isn't that I feel like it's better than all the rest. It, um... I've taken lots of years of studying in seminary Greek and Hebrew, and the 
New American Standard keeps the original word order. And so although it's kind of a choppy reading sometimes, it helps, um, helps me not get so confused when I'm looking at the original language and the, the word order. The, the, New Ameri the New King James Version will almost be identical to this, except for the word order will be changed. Same thing. The ESV, I think, is a little closer to the New American Standard. But as we get to chapter 4, there's a heading on in, in the text that I have that says, Testing the Spirits. Now, think through this. We've, we've just been talking. He says in the last verse of chapter 3, We know by this that he abides in us by the Spirit whom he has given to us. So there's something inside of us. A spiritual being inside us speaking to us and it's very important that we listen and be guided by this spirit now what would be really easy is if every inner voice that I as a Christian had that I could say well if it's an inner voice in me it must be right um, that's clearly not true because in the spiritual world there is God is part of the spiritual world, but Satan is also part of the spiritual world. So, just because I have an inner voice does not mean that it is from God. So, he goes through these the next two chapters, and he's going to um, take out some time and give some illustrations. But really, the next two chapters are different areas, different tests that we can do on ourselves. If I'm hearing an inner voice, how do I know? How do I know this voice is from God and not from Satan or one of his demons? And so really practical stuff here to help us see that with confidence I can say, this is God's voice speaking to me. So in the first three verses of chapter four, we see that, okay, if it's God's voice, it's going to be all about the standard of Jesus Christ. The, the same standard is going to be across the board. Look what it says. Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God. Because many false prophets have gone out into the world. Here's what he says. By this, you know the spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God. Okay, so what's so important about that? Um, Jesus Christ coming in human form, incarnation, gives us a visible example of perfection. Gives us a visible uh, understanding of righteousness and the visible understanding of love. Those two things, remember, righteousness is a relationship with God. Jesus walked on this earth and showed us what it looked like for a person, a human, to have a perfect relationship with God. Also, he also showed us perfect love for other people. Now, what did that, the extent of that love look like Jesus laying down his life for others? Um, so, Jesus gave this perfect example. And if the Spirit of God is speaking, the Spirit of God is never going to minimize the standard. Okay, so the Spirit of God may help us reconcile our sin before God, but never going to minimize sin. Never going to say, well, just don't worry about that sin. That sin's not important. Okay, every sin is important. Every sin is rebellion before God, and every transgression, that's this rebellion, points to what the Old Testament says, this iniquity, this bend in me toward, uh, toward not being right with God. And so my nature, my actions point to my nature. And even as a Christian, every time I sin, it should make it clear, the Holy Spirit should make it very clear to me that I'm living out of my fleshly nature, not my new nature. And so then I confess that as sin and I repent of it and I then move forward in a right relationship with God. So this process, the Holy Spirit is never going to minimize the standard. The Holy Spirit is never going to minimize sin. So 
any voice in you that says, oh, you know, divorce, divorcing your husband or divorcing your wife, is, is, that's not a big thing. Um, it is a big thing. Um, well, you know, gossiping about your neighbor, that's not a big thing. Everybody does that. Um, kind of, let's talk about one specific sin. Let's talk about the sin of worry. So I'm worried all the time and tore out of the frame about my physical health or my physical circumstances or whatever it is. I'm, I'm worried, 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 worried. Okay, now, the Bible, you can go back and read Matthew 6. Jesus clearly states that worry is sin. Okay, And so we get together as, as Christians and we maybe know of somebody that has huge problems with worry. And we just say, hey. You know, you need to just uh, trust God, uh, which, which is true. However, that's not dealing with my sin of worry. So until I put that sin of worry to death in me, it's going to be perpetual. It's going to continue uh, to be a voice in me that's not from God. If I have a voice in me to say, oh, you're not going to have enough to eat. Oh, you're going to die. You're not going to live through this. Okay, whatever it is. That voice isn't from God. Okay, now, this worry in me, what do I do with it? I don't just try harder tomorrow not to worry. I practice righteousness on my worry. Meaning, the Holy Spirit, through the Word, starts to show me that my worry is rebellion against Him. It's really saying that God isn't enough to take care of me. And that is just about as wicked a sin as there is. So in that, I call it sin. I agree with what the Holy Spirit said. It's sin. God, forgive me of my sin of worry. God, I understand that my sin of worry is an affront to your character and your provision in my life. And then, God, help me to trust you. I believe. Help my unbelief. And God will do this. But the process of dealing with the sin of worry isn't trying harder. It's confessing it as sin and dealing with it. If I've complained to my wife or my husband about uh, my doubts, I've voiced my doubts to, and my worry to other people, then I need to go to those people and say, you know, yesterday when I was talking to you about this worry thing in my life, I, I just, will you forgive me for my sin of worry yesterday? Because me talking to you about my worries rather than going to God about them may be spread a spirit of Satan in you and may then help you to maybe start to get worried about certain things. When we're together, we need to build each other up in this relationship, the focus on the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is not the voice in you helping you to worry. The Holy Spirit is the voice of you magnifying Jesus Christ. Now, let's keep going. It, it says this, we go to, to verse 3. It says, And every spirit that does not confess Jesus is not from God. This is the spirit of Antichrist, of which you have heard that it is coming and is now already in the world. There's actively this thing going on that wants to minimize God's standard. Because somehow when we minimize God's standard, we make seemingly Christianity more palatable becomes something that I can maybe more understand. Boy, the church is doing this all over the board right now. Whatever we got to do to get people in. Because really the focus is not trying to be disciples of Jesus Christ, to be uh, in a relationship with God the Father. That's not the point anymore. The point is to get lots of people coming, to get bigger budgets, so we can have bigger buildings and bigger salaries. That's really the essence of it all. I want to be freed from that. God's going to provide for me a place to live. He's going to provide for me something to eat as I commune with him and as I seek to make disciples for him. So first, test the spirit. Number one, the spirit of God is never going to minimize the standard of Jesus Christ. Number two, verses four through six help us to see this, that the spirit of God always is going to be in line with the word of God. Let's read. It says, you are from God, little children, you infants in Christ, 
and you have overcome them. Who are them? These them are the Antichrist and the false prophets, this kind of spirit of the world. It says, because greater is he who is in you than he who is in the world. So I've got uh, the spirit of God in me that is more powerful than any deceitful, deceptive spirit that's speaking to me. Okay, The spirit of God. Now, so again, how do I know that it's the spirit of God? Look what it says. They are from the world. Okay, so the spirit of the world is going to be, remember, lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, boastful pride of life, and minimizing the standard of Jesus Christ. Okay, he's already reiterated the minimizing the standard of Jesus Christ. He says through this, he says, they are from the world and they speak from the world and the world listens to them. Oh, those four entities, lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, pride of life, and minimizing, that makes sense to the world. But it says this, but we, we are from God. He who knows God listens to us, John says. Who is the us here? Clearly, the writers of Scripture, the ones that God has inspired to write this down. Okay, so um, I, I can't see God. God has revealed himself in the written word. He says this, he who is not from God does not listen to the people that wrote this word. By this we know the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. Will the Holy Spirit ever guide me to do something that is in contrary to the word? I remember when I was first pastor, uh, a woman came to me who was having problems in her marriage and she wanted to divorce her husband. And so she came to me first and asked if she could divorce her husband and be okay with God. And I said, hey, you know, God really makes it clear that he hates divorce. Okay, so when God says he hates something, I don't want to be a part of that something. So we went through that process. A few weeks later, she came to me and said, well, I'm going to divorce my husband. I said, well, you know, what happened? And then I went through, if you do this, we're going to have to discipline you because you don't really understand what this looks like. She said, well, I prayed and I asked God uh, to show me whether I should divorce my, uh, my husband. And I had a dream and in that dream, a spirit came over me that said that it was okay for me to divorce my husband. It's, <laughs> no, that's not the spirit of God. And then she said this, well, and I also said, that I'm gonna divorce him, and if God doesn't want me to do it, then he could take my physical life. This is not the way we test the spirits. You wanna know if the Spirit of God is speaking to you, does it align with what the Word of God says? Remember, the Spirit of God and the Word of God work in cooperation with each other, and they help produce conviction in my life. Go back and read 1 Thessalonians chapter 1. Then I have the opportunity with this conviction to confess my idolatry, to confess things that I have put in front of God, and then turn from them and continue on in the right relationship with God. So third, uh, he goes on and he says this. Um, in in verse, verses 7 through 10, He's going to, if the Spirit of God is the voice in me, he's going to be showing me that I have a need for this word called propitiation, um, that I'm under God's wrath, and the only answer to God's wrath over my sinfulness, now, my sinfulness being who I am, not what I do, that because of who I am, God's wrath is on me, and the only answer to God's wrath is Jesus Christ being my substitute and atoning for that sin. Now, anything that minimizes that, like we hear all kinds of people from the emergent church movement right now that are saying, well, you know, there's no reason to ever talk about the wrath of God. God's not angry. Well, if someone says, and if there's a voice in your head that says God doesn't have wrath over sin, that is not the voice of the Spirit of God. Look what it says. It says, Beloved, let us love one another, for love is from God, and everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. 
The one who does not love does not know God, for God is love. Now, the world likes to turn that around, that the Bible says God is love. So the world turns that around and said love is God. Lots of people worship love and their own understanding of what love is as the supreme thing in the world. I'm here, God is love, but love is not God. Love is just one of the attributes of who God is. We like to turn this love around. How do we know what love is? Because God has defined it in the incarnation and the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. It says this, by this the love of God was made known or manifested inside of us that God has sent his only begotten son into the world so that we might live through him. Okay, so this love isn't minimizing sin. The love is that God would show us our sin and give us an answer to our sin. So clearly here, um, I have a need for the wrath of God to be appeased in my life. Um, as I was growing up, I don't know about you, but I used to hear this saying all the time that God hates sin, but loves the sinner. Now it sounds, uh, it's, it's, that sounds like a really good saying. However, that's not the spirit of truth. God doesn't send sin to hell. God sends sinners to hell. Why does he send sinners to hell? Not because of their own sin. Sinner, sinners go to hell because of the sin of Adam. And they are sent to hell because they will not receive the propitiation that is given in Jesus Christ. So anything inside of us that minimizes our need for a perfect Savior, a sacrifice, propitiation from the wrath of God, anything that wants to minimize the wrath of God, is not the voice of the Holy Spirit in our lives. Let's keep moving, because he goes on. Uh, look at, at verses 11 through 16 um, about the Holy Spirit. Look at what it says. Oh, where's verse 11? Here it is. Oh, we didn't read verse 10. It says, in this is love. Not that we loved God. We didn't initiate this. God initiated this. I was blind groping in the darkness as we read from Acts 17. It says that this is the love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us, sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. Chapter 2, verses not for our sins only, but for the sin of the whole world. Now, I love this. Um, we've got God's sovereignty and man's responsibility. So we've got God's sovereignty and the free will of man all wrapped up together. I love it. Don't focus just on one. God initiated love. But as in every relationship, someone has to initiate the love, and then the other uh, entity must respond to that love. God has initiated a love relationship with every one of us. We have the responsibility to respond to that love. If we seek him, we will find him, and we seek him with all of our um, so let's keep going. The voice of the Holy Spirit is going to deal with certain things. Uh, we've learned from John 16, he's going to deal with sin, our own nature. He's going to deal with uh, whether we're in a right relationship with God, and he's going to deal with judgment. Look at verse 11. It says, Beloved, if God so loved us, we ought to love one another. It says, no one has seen God at any time. Um, if we love one another, God abides in us, and his love is being matured, perfected in us. Okay, so remember, when the Holy Spirit comes, he's going to convict the world of sin, righteousness, and judgment. Remember John 16. Of sin, it says, because they don't believe in me. Of sin, because they don't believe in the standard. Right? Minimizing, this is the Antichrist, minimizing the standard, the perfection of what God expects. Maybe making it into something that I can do on my own. Okay? But then the righteousness, 
uh, the, the Spirit is going to convict us of righteousness because I go to, Jesus says, I go to my Father and they no longer can see me walking on this earth of what righteousness looks like. So what am I giving to them? I'm giving you my Spirit and for you to walk around practicing righteousness. So when people, they, they can't see me, but they can see my Spirit working in you. Anything that minimizes the example of a right relationship with God that's practicing righteousness is not the Spirit of God. If anyone tells you, you don't have to think about sin any longer, it's not the Spirit of God. If you have somebody that tells you, look, God has taken away your sin far the east is from the west, you, as long as you're a Christian, you never have to think about sin again. That is not the Spirit of God. Of God. You, you better listen for the hiss of the snake in that. He goes on. He says this. Look at verse 13. He says, By this we know that we abide in him and he in us because he's given us his spirit. We have seen and testified that the Father has sent the Son to be the Savior of the world. So God the Father sent the Son into the world. The Son did the propitiation in the world so that we could satisfy God's wrath. Then the Son ascended, has given us His Spirit. The job of the Holy Spirit is to convict us of sin, righteousness, of judgment, of to be our helper in that. Help illuminate me to what is in my life keeping me from a right relationship with God. Now in that, that's a humbling process. So he's the, also the comforter coming in, comforting me, reminding me that as he's pointing out my sin, there's no condemnation in that sin. Now, he says this in verse 15, whoever confesses that Jesus is the Son of God, abide, God abides in him, and he in God, and we have come to know and have believed the love which God has for us. Even the love, God loves me. He wants me in this relationship. Even though in this relationship, he's going to reveal sin in my life, difficult things. And I'm going to have to go through this process of being reconciled with him by confession and repentance. He goes on, he says, God is love. And the one who abides in love abides in God and God in him. Okay, so this process, this love, don't redefine love. Love is going to be me denying me. Initially, I'm going to deny myself to say God is right and I am wrong. And then I'm going to have to deny myself with other people as I come into the light before them. Not trying to make a big deal of myself trying to make a big deal out of Jesus Christ by confessing my sin and repenting of my sin openly. People are going to be aware of my sinfulness because I'm actively talking about it. I'm coming into the light about it when the whole world is trying to conceal that. So, next aspect, verses 17 and 18 are going to talk about if the Holy Spirit is in you, he's going to help to get rid of the fear I have. Listen to what it says, verse 17. By this, love is matured in us, growing, right? So that we may have confidence in the day of judgment, because as he is, so are we in this world. So I'm growing in this relationship with the Lord right now. Initially, as an infant in Christ, I had all kinds of fear. But as I grow and to know the character of God, as I grow into him dealing with me um, as, as, through my obedience, and what he is showing me. This fear, fear of what? Well, fear of punishment, uh, fear of all kinds of things. I'm not going to have what I need. All the things that the world says. Um, you, you watch TV sometimes and they have all these commercials about life insurance and health insurance. All these things that you should have. And you start getting this spirit of worry and fear coming up. And God is the answer for fear. Go to him with my fear. Look what it says in verse 18. There is no fear in love. Okay. So if I'm living in fear of God that I can't really trust him, it really means there's a deficiency in love. 
not a deficiency in how much God loves me, but a deficiency in how much I love him. And really that deficiency of not loving him enough becomes that I don't know him enough and I need to spend more time with his spirit in the word of God. Look like what he says, he says, perfect love gets rid of all fear. So uh, God has perfect love toward me. I'm growing and being perfected and maturing in my love for him. So I'm going to have fear. So what do I do with that fear? Um, I'm going to take my fear back to him. The Holy Spirit, if you've ever hear a voice in you, you know, condemning you over your sin, that's not the Spirit of God. The Spirit of God will convict you of sin to be reconciled with God. But if there's a voice in you saying there's no hope for you, your past any God using you in any meaningful way because of la di da that you did in your life. That's not the Spirit of God. The Spirit of God is casting out fear. Look what it says. It says this. Perfect love casts out fear because fear involves what? Punishment. The punishment has been taken by Jesus Christ. There's no condemnation. I don't have to be afraid of God punishing me. God is not the whack-a-mole God waiting for you to mess up so he can punish you. Now, he will discipline you. The difference between punishment and discipline is vast. Punishment is for the purpose of payback, retribution. Discipline is for the purpose of helping you to grow and to get stronger in your dependence on the Lord. There is no punishment for the Christian by God. There is only discipline for our good. If I'm afraid that God is going to destroy me, that's not the voice of the Holy Spirit. Look what it said. The one who fears is not perfected in love. If you have all these fears in your life about things, if worry is constantly being pulled up in you, just let you know, that you don't love God as much as you need to. What's the remedy for that? We've talked about this, but let's say it again. The remedy for this is to confess it as sin and spend uh, repent of that sin by spending more time in the Word, getting to know God so that you can grow in love. Then I can start. Uh, if, if you're wrapped up in fear, you're either in the infant stage or the toddler stage because in the young the teenage stage, the young man stage, God's word starts to begin implanted in me. And when those voices of fear and worry start to come up, I can answer them with the word of God. These are a couple good verses to memorize. So that when these fears and these worries crop up in us, we can speak to it with what the Holy Spirit has inspired from the word of God. Um, as, as we finish up this chapter, the last test in this chapter is uh, from verses 19 through 21. If it's the Holy Spirit in me, he's going to prompt me to love other people like Jesus Christ loved. Look what it says. It says this, we love, verse 19, why? Because he first loved us. I can't love other people without ulterior motives unless I've already being in a love relationship with God. So uh, that doesn't mean people that aren't saved aren't doing nice things for other people, but there's a, a motive behind it, a, a selfish motive, in whether it's you know lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, pride of life, or whatever. In Christ, I'm getting everything that I need from him. Uh, through my relationship with God the Father, I'm getting everything that I need. And in that, that then is enabling me to be able to love other people even if I never receive anything back. Oftentimes when I'm doing premarital counseling, there's this idea in marriage that I will love this other person as long as they love me. And it'll be kind of a 50-50 thing. Well, Christian marriage is different. Christian love is different. Christian love is that I will get everything that I need from my relationship with God and that I can then sacrifice without getting anything in return in this way with other people. This is the problem when we see in church when people say, I'm quitting 
anything that I'm serving because nobody appreciates it. Well, that doesn't show that there's a lack of appreciation. It shows that there's a lack of getting everything that I need from God. The Holy Spirit is always going to be prompting us to love as Christ loved. That's sacrificially. Love even when I don't receive anything in return. And if there's a voice in you saying, you need to stop serving, you need to stop loving people because they're not, they don't appreciate you. That's not the voice from God. That's a deceiving spirit trying to sow a doubt and fear in your life. Look what it says. If someone says, I love God, but won't deny themselves for their brother, hates his brother, he's a liar. For the one who does not love his brother whom he has seen cannot love God whom he has not seen. Okay, Which is harder, to love somebody you see or somebody you can't see? Well, obviously, it's easier to love someone that I can see. Now, what we find happening is because we can't see God, it seems to be pretty easy for people to say, well, I love God, and there's no visible way to prove it. Well, he's saying here, the Spirit of God shows that if I have a love relationship for God, the way it shows is by my love for other people. So the, the two go together. He says this in verse 21, And this command that we have from him, that the one who loves God is going to love others also. If I'm having problems in my relationships with other people, it's because I have problems in my relationship with God. Um, now abides faith, hope, and love. The greatest of these is love, Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 13. Now, remember this. Faith is this walk with God. Uh, love is this love for other people. And the hope is that one day all that will be brought together. Now, the reason that love is the greatest of these is because, hey, uh, the only way I know that I have my faith in God and that I have hope for the future is that daily I'm denying myself in love for other people. I hope this has been a good uh, Saturday study for you in, on this Sabbath day. So let's pray and let's seek the Lord. Father, we love you. May we find our rest in you, not in a day of the week, not in a a building that we go to, but may your son, Jesus Christ, be our Sabbath rest. And so, Father, today, on this Saturday, may you uh, renew us through the word. As we have come and seen, now may we go and tell. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Bye.